Hi everyone, um, I'm Nolene Hammond-Jones. I'm the International Careers Manager in the LUMS Career Service. Um, today's session is how to succeed in the workplace. So let me just, first of all, um, if you have any questions at all, you can put them in the chat box. Um, I will check the chat box periodically as we go through. So you don't have to wait till the end, just put those um, any questions that you have or contributions, you can put those in the chat area. Um, today's session is being recorded and the recording should be available within a week, maybe a little bit longer um, as we have staff away from the office this week. But in about eight, nine days, this recording should be available on our YouTube channel. If you've not checked out our YouTube channel, please do. Um, we've got some great events that we have recorded on there. So... Moving on to the next slide. So what we're going to cover today is just, uh, first of all, highlighting your awareness around the rights, your rights um, in the workplace in the UK. Um, and this also will cover um, understanding professional etiquette in the UK, employers' expectations, managing issues at work and workloads, um, but also the value of reflecting on your work experiences as well um, and potentially keeping a journal just so that you can log any experiences that you had uh, for future applications, whether that be um, to refer to an interview or in CVs and also highlighting the careers resources that you have access to. For those of you who are not familiar in the UK, this is reviewed every April. Um, so the living wage or minimum wage in the UK is reviewed every April, and this is the most recent update. So the national living wage is for those 23 and over is currently at £10.42. And then the minimum wage is age related, and you can see what those figures are there. Also to work in the UK, you need what's called a national insurance number. If you haven't got a national insurance number, you can apply for one online. It is quite simple and it's similar to a social security number, a tax number, and it's just a way for the government to ensure that you're paying the right tax. Um, you can work without a national insurance number, um, but you will pay what's called emergency tax, which is where you pay half your salary or half your wage to the government, but you can claim that back once you get your national insurance number. Um, to save any issues, do apply for a national insurance number if you intend to work in the UK. Um, also as well, it will help employers to engage with you more positively um, because they are wary of hiring anybody without a national insurance number. So just so that you're aware. Um, also as well to share with you when working in the UK, whether it's a part-time job, internship, placement, or a graduate role, you are usually issued with an employment contract uh, to work in the UK. And the employment contract will have information in there around your agreed working hours or working hours expectations, the location of where you will be expected to work from, what your holiday allowance or annual leave is, uh, sickness policy, dress code, and equality, diversity, and inclusion. Now, sometimes when we do get a contract, and I know this when you get a new phone or any other agreement that you sign, we don't always read the fine print, but it is really important when you do receive your contract, and as exciting as it can be being given a job offer, whether again, it's for an internship, volunteering role, uh, placement, or graduate graduate role, you want to get back to the HR department really quickly, sign that contract so that you can sort your final date for your start of, um, start of work. Do be aware that all the information you need is in that document and you should really take the time to read the document carefully, including your agreed salary, start date, everything is in there. So in the UK, you, depending on the role, you will get what's called a holiday allowance or annual leave allowance um, as part of your job offer or contract, depending on the contract you sign. So it's important to be aware of that. Now, compared to other countries, the UK is quite generous um, and you there will also be other caveats in there around how much leave you can take at once, how much holiday. So if you're given 20 days holiday for the year, most companies will not permit you 
to take 20 consecutive days unless it's for exceptional circumstances. Um, so do be aware that there are caveats around these uh, permissions given to you around holiday allowance, annual leave. Also as well, companies have sickness policies um, and this will impact your pay as well. Uh, so there will be a period of time where if you've uh, supplied a doctor's note, you will be given uh, your full salary, but after a certain agreed period of time, that salary can then be impacted um, and reduced um, depending on how long you're sick. So again, be aware. Also as well, companies have sickness policies around if you are sick for more than um, X number of consecutive days, uh, you can trigger um, a flag with HR where you might be referred to occupational uh, health for support in case there is anything that they can do. So for instance, if your work environment is having an impact on your health. So um, I've had a quick question. Um, I want to have my internship in the UK this summer, is it possible? So if you are um, applying for internships and you're based outside the UK, it can be a bit difficult because companies in the UK the, are, tend to aim their internships at UK institutions. I'm not saying it's impossible. And again, if you're flexible in terms of the organization and the sector, it certainly is possible to get an internship, but they are very competitive. Companies, especially the larger organizations, aim their internships at uh, second year students in the summer before you proceed to your final year. So it tends to be a very short period of time when this is available and it's aimed at a very specific cohort of student as well. So just be mindful of that if you're applying for jobs. But these policies still apply, including dress code. And dress code is one of those things that people hate addressing. Um, but it has relaxed in a lot of industries um, since the pandemic and the return to hybrid working or working in the office. So do your research and don't be afraid to ask as well to clarify what is the dress code or dress code policy for the organization. And that will differ depending on the sector that you are going into. And equality, diversity and inclusion. Most companies now have an EDI policy um, and that helps the company to stay aligned to their values. And also a diverse workforce is um, more beneficial to an organization. So if you are interested in something that is part of your, um, is, is something that's really important to you, also research the company's EDI policy because that can impact you as well. In terms of equality, diversity and inclusion, be aware of the Equality Act 2010, which protects you from discrimination. So when applying for jobs in the UK in particular, and this is specifically for the UK, um, we don't include uh, identifiable characteristics or age, date of birth, those kinds of things, or your picture on applications, because that can lead to discrimination. So we advise um you to research again what the application processes are in the UK so that it you're giving yourself the best opportunity. It is unlawful for employers not to accept applications from or employ someone on the basis of their nationality. So if you are an international student based in the UK or an international student overseas, um, you should not be um, rejected based on your visa status or your um, nationality. Now the visa status is for internships, again, going back to that question, if you are studying in the UK, you are covered under your student visa to work full-time during the summer if you are an undergraduate. If you are a postgraduate student, your summertime is considered term time. So therefore you can only work 20 hours a week. So understand what the visa regulations are in relation to your level of study and the student visa that you are working on. Um, in terms of applying for graduate level roles, employers, if you are studying in the UK um, and you are looking to be sponsored, cannot discriminate against you based on your visa status. So if you are the best candidate for the role and you need sponsorship, 
This includes as well, if you are outside the UK, then the company is in a position um, to sponsor you. If they do not have a sponsor license, they should get a sponsor license. So do know what your rights are as an applicant, um, especially if you are considered an international student or graduate. If you're an international student looking for an internship and you are not studying in the UK on a student visa, you might find it much harder to get work because you would not have a you would not be able to do an internship on a holiday visa or visitors visa. So be aware of what your rights are and what your options are to do that. Um, if you also have pre-settled status, um, it depends if you are on pre-settled status now and you would like to um, stay in the UK longer term, consider settled status. Um, if you apply for settled status and are granted settled status as an EU uh, resident, then you will not need to then be sponsored. Um, you will only need sponsorship if you are on a visa in the UK. So that's the time then that you will need. So if you're currently on a visa, sponsorship is something that you will have to consider. Now, there are very complicated, everybody's visa situation is very different. I'm not going to go into all of the different scenarios. Um, what I will say is you need to embrace your current situation, understand what your options are in relation to your visa and your um, work goals, whether they be in the UK or elsewhere in the world. And the more you know, the more empowered you're going to be to make those informed decisions. I will also share with you some resources later on to help you to research what your options are. Um, in addition to this, as I said, many employers um, will have a set of values where they identify, similar to identifying as a person, and find employers that reflect those values. Check their website and check their EDI statement, as mentioned previously. Many employers as well and professional bodies run insight events or work experience schemes aimed at underrepresented groups in the sector as well. So do check out those events. And if you have access to Careers Connect, you can also find information on Careers Connect. Window is a platform um, that employers post their EDI stats or statistics on there um, to help you make an informed decision so that you can see how diverse um, a company actually is. The company pays for the privilege to be on this platform. Um, you should have free access to the platform. You may be required to set up um, an account, um, but it does help to, again, inform your decision making. What company do you want to work for and what values do you want the organization to have many employers as well have really good initiatives in recruiting a diverse workforce and that includes the disability confident employer scheme stonewall top 100 employers list the race equality charter and athena swan charter so if you're not familiar with those do research them because they will again help you to understand the types of organizations that you want to work for um, in terms of a family visa, still need a sponsor or not, I'm moving from student visa to spouse visa. If you are a dependent on someone else's visa, you do not need sponsorship. So if you are not the visa holder, but you will be a dependent on that visa, then a company does not need to sponsor you. Okay. So in terms of what to expect in your first 100 days, apply academic skills into practice. It is really important that the theoretical learning that you are gaining through your program helps you to um, succeed in the workplace through applying those theoretical skills in a, in a practical context. Um, so gaining that uh, professional experience, developing new skills, um, working to improve existing skills as well. So self-awareness is really important to understand where your skill sets are and how to improve on those skill sets. The ones that you are currently great at, that's fantastic, but you're always looking to develop and, and companies are always looking to hire individuals and also to promote individuals who embrace development. Um, Building up your network as well is going to be absolute key. So even if you're doing a two week summer school or a two week uh, insight opportunity, make connections, gather connections via LinkedIn. If you do not have a LinkedIn account, 
please make a LinkedIn account because that's going to be absolutely crucial to your professional network and building up your career prospects going forward. There are some really good webinars and recordings on our YouTube channel on what to do in setting up a LinkedIn account. So if you haven't got LinkedIn, do look at setting up LinkedIn for yourself. Who you know is as important as what you know. So do think about even though somebody may not be in a position right now to help you, so they're maybe studying alongside you and they're doing the same insight week, adding them to your network can be really crucial because in two years time when you're ready to graduate, they could get a role in an organization that you are really interested in or something that really aligns with your values and they can open doors for you. So make sure that you're building up those connections and thinking about the future as well, not just how people can help you now, but how people can possibly help you in the future. And also as well, use these experiences to check if this industry is, is for you. So the role I always say of your first job as either work experience or as a graduate, if you don't work while you're studying and your first role is when you graduate, the the that role will help you to understand what does and doesn't fit for you, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. So that when you're making that career decision making going forward, that you can look at um, your experience and find experiences that have more of what you enjoy, more of what energizes you, and more that aligns with your skills and knowledge that you're developing. So it's, it's a progressional thing. So you your first experience, you might think, oh, I really want to work in a large organization. You gain an experience in a large organization and realize, actually, I don't want to have a very narrowed um, opportunity where I have a very specific role. I want to work in a smaller organization where I can work more broadly and gain skills and insights into other areas of the business. So it's always worth thinking about how can I really be more self-aware of my experience? How is this experience impacting me? And what can I do for that next role? And also as well, development and progression are really important. From day one, you need to be looking at what are my development opportunities? What are my progression opportunities? Because you, the more aware you are of what these opportunities, skills, training um, is available to you, the, the quicker you're going to progress in your career. In terms of what employers expect from you, they're looking for a professional attitude. What I mean by that is somebody who um, is a problem solver, who can use their initiative, who comes to the employer potentially, I have discovered this problem, but I have X, Y, and Z solution for you. Um, having that professional attitude as well is not reacting to stressful situations, um, not speaking badly of your colleagues or your manager, um, bringing with you a good mood into the office. And we all have personal things going on in our lives, but making sure that you're not bringing that into the office with you and working in a very um, collegiate way can really demonstrate your professional attitude. Cultural awareness as well. Be aware of your surroundings, of your team, of the various different cultures and cultures within cultures. So, you know, people all communicate in different ways and being aware of those different communication styles, different learning styles. For instance, I'm a visual learner. Um, when you're presenting to your team or you're having team meetings, take into account the different types of learning and communication and cultural nuances so that you can get the best out of your team and the best out of your own position within the organization. And be aware of timing in the UK punctuality is key be early rather than risk being late and bring the energy with you um, enthusiasm and curiosity one of the biggest feedbacks that we've had from employers um, is something they, they've identified over the time that we were all working from home during the pandemic is that they want individuals to have new ideas and approaches and be enthusiastic and curious and be dynamic problem solvers. Using that initiative can really help to make you stand out from, from your colleagues 
volunteer for things that are going to help you in your development, but also in your skills um, and help you to contribute to the team and the strategic goals that your organization has. The employer also expects you to learn quickly. We've had to learn a lot of new skills in a very short space of time, and that's not changing. Technology is changing on a weekly basis. Um, expectations from employers are growing in terms of how technologically um, skilled you are. And so being able to learn quickly can help you progress in your career. Um, and that you'll do what's needed. It's pitching in. It's not saying to an employer, oh, that wasn't in my employment contract or that wasn't, you know, that wasn't in the job description. Sometimes there are occasions where we all just have to work well as part of a team and just um, support one another in whatever task, event, activity that we're doing. So the more proactive you are and the more of a team player you are, the better it will look for you in your career. In the chat, I would like you to give me your um, insights into this. So this is a workplace scenario. So you've started your internship at a technology company that supplies hardware equipment to businesses such as monitors, keyboards, laptops. One of your clients that you manage um, contacts you to inform you of a fault with the equipment that they have received for their new hires. So they've hired new staff, they've ordered equipment from you and that equipment has faults. The client is very aggressive on the phone and states that this is not the first time this has happened. What are you going to do? How are you going to deal with this situation? How are you going to react? So I want you to put into the chat area now, how should you handle this situation? What would you do in this situation if a client contacted you on the phone, on Teams, on Zoom, to let you know that they weren't happy? So there's a number of different things to consider here. There's a risk to future business. There is a risk to company reputation. There may be a risk to your reputation. What steps should you take with the client? What, how would you manage that situation? Put in the chat area now what you think you would do. What options do you think you have? And what should you not do? So I want to hear from you if you were in that situation. Firstly, how would you react? Would you be aggressive back to the client? Would you be defensive? Would you be listening? What's the first thing that you would do? And then from that, how would you handle the situation? Give me two or three steps that you would take if you were speaking to this client. And this isn't uh, an unusual situation. So again, depending on your industry and depending on your sector, you may come across clients um, or uh, individuals that you work with. They could be customers, clients that may not be happy with the level of service or have an expectation of a level of service that for whatever reason is not being delivered. But of course, you're their point of call. You're the first person that they're going to be speaking to, and therefore you're the person that's going to get the frustration from the client, the anger from the client, especially if they're paying a lot of money for a very particular service. So I would like to know, what do you think would happen? So yeah, if you want to involve your manager, so somebody's come and said, I would discuss this with my manager, which is a good step. But if you're on the phone with that client, would you immediately escalate that to your manager or would you try and handle the situation yourself? Which would you do? So if you just post that in the chat for me. Handle it yourself. Great. So, yes. I would say the first thing to do is take ownership of the situation. So this is your client and you want to be able to work with your client. So sometimes just sympathizing with your client, empathizing with your client, listening to your client is sometimes all they need. And then walking through with the client, how, you, how would they like you to help them? 
So firstly, I would apologise to the client and hear them out, then let them know that they're working on rectifying the issue. Fantastic. Exactly. It's taking measured steps. So listening, and sometimes it is, it's just, there's so much going on in a client's um, workplace. Sometimes it's, they just want to let it all out and you're the person that unfortunately gets that aggression. So yes, being mindful, listening, empathizing, agreeing, yes, of course, no, that isn't acceptable. We do appreciate your business. We appreciate working with you. How would you like me to help you? What are you looking for today? Just using that nice calm language, calm tone, understanding tone can help to de-escalate a situation. Um, I will reassure the client first for resolving the problem and then respond to managers. Yes. So resolving the problem and then keeping managers updated with clients and also keeping management updated with issues. So if technology or equipment is going out to clients and it has there's frequent faults reported, that's something that needs to be escalated up in case that we have a supplier we're working with as an organization that may have problems or to be able to contact that supplier and find out why, what is happening in the supply chain that means that these clients are getting faulty equipment? Could it be that the equipment's getting damaged in transit? Is that because we're using um, a, a disreputable courier? So there are lots of conversations that you can have, but ultimately it's staying calm. It's listening to the client, empathizing with the client, Sometimes putting it back in the client's uh, hands to say, how do you want me to help you? I will see what I can do. I will look and see what we can do. I will speak to the supplier. I'll speak to the courier. And I will update you once I have more information. That in itself can be enough to help a client calm down and feel secure in the knowledge that you're handling the issue on their behalf. So do... Um, take those steps and that's just an example of one issue that may arise in a workplace scenario professional attitude is understanding the cultural norms of the organization things like work hours um, dressing appropriately for the workplace um, understanding how colleagues like to address each other um, lunch arrangements making sure that you're including individuals within that um, within any arrangements that you're you're making making sure that you're not isolating any members of the team and being present and paying attention during meetings I know it can be really hard sometimes especially if you're working in a remote situation where you might be on your phone you know, it's it, and it can be tempting. Sometimes I've seen where you might be having chats. It is very notable when you're online or in person if somebody is not paying attention. So being present and taking notes can show managers that you're listening, that you're being attentive, and you're 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 noting the important things that are being said. Working during work hours. I know that sounds common sense, and it is, but Again, sometimes we can forget that the work laptop is our work laptop and we might be surfing the web, we might be on our social media, especially when you're working from home. So be mindful that during your work hours, especially for your well-being as well, it's very important to separate work and home, especially if you're working in a hybrid manner or working remotely from home. If you don't put boundaries in place for yourself, and I'll talk about this um, in more detail, but if you don't put boundaries in your place that this is this is the room where you do your work, this is the time you start work, even going for a walk before work, um, it can not it, it can impact you on a personal level because you're not putting boundaries in place. So make sure that you keep a separate laptop for personal um, work that you're doing and your work laptop or your work equipment that you don't be using it for personal reasons um, or as little as you can for personal reasons um, in order to, to be focused. Embracing tasks, even when it's not what you really want to be doing. So if it means everybody goes into the office and is filling envelopes for a big event, it's not something you want to do, but you know, it's a team task and you're being a team player and you have a professional positive attitude in that moment. 
answering the phone and email professionally, not using abbreviations, um, not being too informal unless you've got a very well established relationship with clients or with colleagues. Um, and being on time and preferably early for meetings, uh, especially if you're not sure of locations or in case you have technical issues. So just to give you an example, my laptop, when I plug my headset in, um, works fine. But then if I take my headset out and I join a meeting, my laptop refuses to acknowledge that it has an inbuilt microphone. So I have to restart my machine before I can join a meeting. Um, so I know if I'm going to join a meeting and I was using my headset earlier, I have to restart my machine. So taking into account little nuances like that, but it means if I do it well in advance, especially anticipating updates, which always get you about 10 minutes before the start of a meeting, your computer goes, oh, you've restarted. Oh, now we have 10 minutes of updates. So give yourself plenty of time to restart a machine or to make sure that everything is working in terms of your tech. Uh, for online meetings and hybrid working. So again, when you're working in a hybrid environment, whether it's at home or working remote, uh, remote fully, um, dress for the office in appropriate clothes as well. Um, make sure that your equipment is working well. The number of times I've been in meetings, especially when it's a one-to-one -one meeting and someone says, oh, my camera's not working. It's really difficult to have that meeting when your camera's on, their camera's off, and you're not being able to gauge their um, facial expressions, their body language. It can be really awkward. So making sure that your equipment works, and if it's not working, reporting it as soon as possible as a priority to your IT team so that you can either get it fixed or get a replacement. Um, don't ignore video calls either, um, especially if it's coming from senior members of the team, because that just reflects really badly on you. Even if you are in a position where, and this is where the dressing appropriately, so if you've decided, oh, you know, I'll just wear my pajamas for the first hour of work, I'll get dressed in a bit, and then your manager rings you, and this is within your working hours, and you're not dressed, that can look very badly on you. So, always be prepared, make sure that you're ready from the, you know, as if you're going into the office and then you're not put in any awkward situations. Make sure your background is appropriate. If you don't have an appropriate background, get a virtual background, which is just an image. Now, most of the platforms, Teams and Zoom have inbuilt um, backgrounds that you can use, um, but also your um, company might have branded, which side am I on that way, branded um, backgrounds as well. So if your company has branded backgrounds, make sure that you upload them to your platforms so that you can use them um, when you're going into meetings or if you're in a team uh, online scenario. Make sure your microphone is muted and make sure your microphone is not muted when it's your turn to talk. I Literally, you know, it's an ongoing joke and there are so many memes out there at the moment where it's you're, you're muted, you're 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 muted or we're hearing inappropriate sounds it's like somebody isn't muted. Um, when you look through a participants list or uh, attendee list, you can actually see who's not muted. Don't be that person. Always check, always check before you go into any meeting, you can set to mute before you join the meeting. Some meet some meetings, depending on the format will pre-mute you. So they'll make sure that any attendees such as this webinar, you are muted. In order for you to unmute, I will have to give you permissions, um, but make sure that you mute. Uh, time management, we've already gone into this, is important. Um, and time zones, be especially for these global organizations, it is important to be aware of time zones um, and what those time zones are and what impact that will have on you in terms of meeting expectations of the employer, um, attending online meetings, if uh, they're with overseas clients or overseas offices. Um, and that's where the boundaries come into, into effect as well as to protect your well-being that you're not working 15, 20 hour days. Chat etiquette as well. Remember when you're chatting on these platforms, chat can be recorded by the organizer and they can look back at your private chats if you have um, if you have participated in chat on these platforms. So do 
make sure that even in a chat capacity, if you're chatting privately with another member of the team, that you keep it professional at all levels because it can be looked back on. Um, and also as well, this is something that I think a lot of people forget about. We fill our days with meetings, back-to-back -back meetings, but you have a job to do as well. So make sure that you schedule time to do your admin, to answer your emails, to make those calls, whether it's on Zoom, Teams, or on the phone. Make sure that you, if you're asked to do a presentation, that you schedule in time to create that presentation, research that presentation. So admin time is just as important as meeting time and having that scheduled out can really help you to get through the working week in a really productive way. Communication is so important and language especially, making sure that you use professional language, that you stay away from using slang, swear words, um, in the workplace, it's not appropriate. Um, making sure that you are not uh, insulting anybody. Be aware of cultural nuances. Um, I've had a, a number of times where I speak English, I am not British, but people assume I am or make reference to, oh, well, you're basically British. And it's kind of like, well, no, that's not my identity. And, um, you know, that's not something that... I would identify as and um, it can be taken and cause upset to some people if you don't take into account cultural nuances so um, always be aware of respecting the cultures within your team and the subcultures within your team as well but also if you don't understand something ask questions anybody who comes from either so for instance somebody wanted to know about my culture about my background um I would happily explain that to to a member of my team if asked if that made them feel more comfortable or if they were just curious um but also be aware that within language depending on the culture that you're speaking to there can be a lot of hidden meanings or double double meanings to what people are saying so if you're not sure the outcome of a meeting or a conversation, clarify, ask for clarification. So to give you an example, and I'm sorry if you've been to one of my sessions before and you've heard this, but when I first moved to the UK and people would say, they'd finish a conversation with me saying, let's do coffee sometime. And I'd be like, okay, when are we doing coffee? And they're like, sorry, what? And I'm like, what are we doing coffee? You said, let's do coffee. And they're, they're thinking, I've that. I'm, that's just I'm just saying bye I'm I, I I will do coffee with you at some point but I don't have it in my head right now when I'm available and I'm like oh right okay so that's your way of saying bye right that's fine I now understand um even though I speak English uh, uh you know as fluently as a British person we use different words we use words mean different things and then you also have the colloquialism. So, um, for instance, uh, there's several different names for bread in the UK, depending on where you live. So, again, getting clarification on what that might be. So if somebody asks you, do you want something? Don't be afraid to say, sorry, what, what is that? Or can you explain that to me? Or I'm not I'm not quite understanding what you're asking me ask the question because the last thing you would want to do is assume they're saying something that they're not and then cause a misunderstanding. And accents as well. And this isn't about your accent. It is about um, accents can cause, again, misunderstandings. If somebody has a strong accent, so um, an accent from the Northwest or a really strong, I, when I first came to the UK, I had a really strong Irish accent and I spoke really quickly um again people could sit there and think I don't know what what you're saying don't be afraid to say sorry could you just slow down slightly I'm not quite catching what you're saying and your accent is new to me or I'm adjusting to your accent and, and or I'm not good with accents because that is an, another thing as well um just make sure that you are aware of that and if you've got a strong accent yourself just slow down a little bit um I have over the years and my accent has diminished um but it is a case of just being aware that when you speak, to speak um, a little bit slower um, or to ask somebody if they have quite a strong accent or quite a regional accent, could they slow it down just a little bit so that you can understand. And business level English as well. So those of you who don't have English as a first language and you're looking to work in the UK, 
employers will expect you to have business level English. Oh, and just to clarify as well with accents, accents won't stop you getting a job. They're not going to stop you. And no, no employer is going to judge you in um, an interview either on your accent, just to put that to, because I know sometimes I get students who say, I'm worried about my accent, never. Because in the UK, there are that many accents. Um, employers do not hire people based on their accents. They're very, very inclusive. So don't ever worry about your accent. My accent changes depending on who I talk to because I've been here for so long. Um, so embrace I still want you to embrace that element of yourself that is so it's your it's your I you know it's your identity it's your accent be proud of it just make sure that when you're talking you just slow it down a little bit so that we all understand because I can get carried away my husband knows when I've been speaking to my mother on the phone because my accent will get 20 times stronger um so but getting back to business level English it is really really important as well to to know your industry, research your sector, know the terminology you're going to be using for your business so that you develop that business level English. That if you're in a situation with a client where you have had no time to prepare, you can have a confident conversation and you feel comfortable talking with colleagues or clients about a business uh, project, issue, plan, whatever it may be. So make sure that you do your research and there's things that you can do to help. And it's simple things like if you watch your favorite shows dubbed in English, I know it can be painful. I know it can be painful because my husband loves watching uh, anime and manga and he hates it being dubbed. He'd rather read the subtitles, but it can help you because you're familiar with the stories to develop that conversational English in a more confident way. So if you feel that you um, need to develop, there's simple things you do. Reading the news and keeping up to date on the latest developments in your area. So there are a lot of journals as well for different sectors. So if you're interested in accounting and finance, there's the accounting finance journal. If you're interested in engineering, there's engineering journals. And you can read those journals online for free, which will help you to know what's happening in the markets, in the sectors, and it'll help to build up your knowledge of the terminology in your specialist areas as well. So be mindful of that when, and also as well, it will help you when you're applying for jobs because you will have that sector level information. Managing issues in the workplace in the UK um, can sometimes be one of those things people are like, I don't know what to do. So for instance, with a personality clash, it can be awkward because you're not sure what do I do? Um, we don't get on, but we have to work together. And what I would say is always be professional. When we talked about being polite, being considerate, even if somebody irritates you, try not to show it because people are always watching your body language, your facial expressions, um, your tone of voice is really important. Make sure that if there is a personality clash that you either try and resolve that with the individuals how can we work better together is there something I can do to make it you know to make things a, a more positive environment or just be professional and civil you are not going to like every single person you ever work with but do not let them stop you or create a situation where you become the problem so always manage those very carefully because it can be easy if you retaliate or if somebody has an issue with you and you retaliate, sometimes you can be the person that's in the wrong. So try and always manage those um, relationships delicately. Listen, be prepared, and then vent when you get home. Speak to your partner, your cat, your hamster, vent it out when you get home, but just keep that professionalism within the workplace. Making a mistake as well, I think what a lot of employers appreciate is accountability. If you've made a mistake and you fix it, great. But if you make a mistake, instead of getting defensive or worried that an employer may um, target you, it's best to say, I made a mistake, I addressed it straight away, or as soon as I was made aware of that mistake, I fixed that mistake, this is what I did to fix that mistake, and it won't happen again. And that comes across much better than someone who 
maybe denies making the mistake or gets quite defensive. Oh, well, I didn't know, or I wasn't trained or, you know, try not to be defensive. It is just a case of, I made the mistake. I've researched this area now. I know what to do for next time. I've made sure that that doesn't happen again. And minor mistakes, employers expect that in your first 100 days. They know you're not gonna know everything, but don't be afraid that if you need help and you've made a mistake to ask for that help, Familiarize yourself with the rules of the organization. A lot of these rules are in the contract that I mentioned at the start of the, of the webinar. So do familiarize yourself with your contract. And then when you go through your induction, which is your um, training when you join the company, every company has an induction um, schedule, which can vary. Um, but generally they will make you do some training. They will make you familiarize yourself with online platforms that the company uses, but also with HR rules and regulations. And they will either um, walk you through the HR portal or they will um, show you where it is and ask you to take time to familiarize yourself with the rules. Too little work. So not contributing enough to the organization can also be an issue. Um, so making sure that you are meeting your employer's expectations, making sure that if you don't have check-ins or one-to-one -one meetings with your manager, that you ask for those if you need them to keep up to date on what is expected of you and your workload. Um, and if you're unsure what to do or have too much work to do, that you're communicating with your employer um, around your workload and by too much work to do, um, that's highly unlikely in your uh, work experience or your graduate role. Um, and in most cases, employers will expect you to manage your workload effectively. And it may be that they ask you to take some training on around either time management, prioritizing workloads, or potentially asking you to find a buddy or a mentor, somebody within the organization who can help you to manage your time manage your workload effectively and also communicate in, in, a, in a professional way. So when handling issues at work, whatever those issues may be, be professional. Don't be don't get irritated as much as things can happen and be irritating. Be professional. Take accountability and responsibility if you have made a mistake or something has gone wrong identify solutions even if the if your manager says that is not how i want to resolve this you've come to them with a solution and that always looks better than someone that comes to their manager with problem after problem it's fine to go to management with a problem as long as you've thought of a solution and using your buddy or your mentor to help you come up with a solution is a way forward as well especially if you're very very new to the workplace learn from your mistakes if you've made a mistake, don't make it again. If your manager has told you that this doesn't work, this is how they like things, you need to keep that in mind and seek support. That's what I mentioned with the buddy or the mentor. Seek support from your colleagues. Seek support from a buddy or a mentor. Even seek uh, support from your peers or friends can help you to manage these situations by giving you advice and insights. Prioritizing workload and managing your time is really, really important in the workplace. If you're unclear, ask questions. The worst thing that can happen is you're not sure what you've been asked to do. You go away and you spend a day or two doing something and it's not even close to what you were asked to do. And that shows an employer that you weren't listening, but that probably wasn't the case. You were just unclear as to what they wanted. So if you are unclear or you have doubts, around tasks that you've been assigned or information that you've been given, ask questions. They don't mind. Employers and managers don't mind being asked questions. They would rather you ask a question and do what they wanted you to do than spend time doing something that they didn't ask for. Um, also engage with the buddy system or the mentoring and if there isn't a buddy system or mentoring and you feel you would benefit from that or you've engaged in similar systems through university as an ambassador or in part-time jobs request it might be something the company would think that's a really good idea that's a great initiative why haven't we thought of this before you can request a buddy or a mentor within your work environment if you've not been assigned one so do keep that in mind when you are setting yourself plans, goals, objectives, think smart. Work smarter, not harder. 
So make sure that any goals or objectives that you set are very specific and you can create yourself, uh, you know, get yourself something like this, or you could keep a note on your laptop. There's great platforms that you can help like Padlet that you can engage with to keep your uh, goals, your to-do list, your plans, whichever way, whether it's digitally or physically, keeping those goals, objectives, to do this and plans can really help you to take um, accountability for what you're doing, but also keep track of what you're doing and to prioritize. So make sure any goals or objectives that you set are specific, that you can measure them. How well are you doing? Are you meeting these goals? Also, what actions you need to take in order to meet these objectives or goals. And be realistic. Don't set yourself targets or goals that are, you know, five, 10 years down the line. Um, that you're not going to be um, to be able to meet. And timed means set yourself. So for instance, if you want to uh, improve your skills in Excel, that's a nice specific objective. You are going to um, ensure that by the time you, uh, or what you want to do in Excel, sorry, in order to be measurable, is that you want to be able to manipulate data and produce reports and graphs, okay? Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to sign up to some training, you're going to do some tasks for the office, and you're going to get a buddy or a mentor to check your work. Uh, you're going to be realistic in the sense that you can do this over a timed uh, two-week period. And over that two weeks, by the end of that, you're going to be a confident user of Excel. It's a smart objective. Create to-do lists, again, they can help keep you on track. I know that, um, and not everybody needs to-do lists either. I do, because if I don't have a to-do list, I will forget what I'm doing. So I have to-do lists everywhere and I update my to-do lists and then I bring my to-do lists together if I've got one or two on the go. Um, so I'm constantly reviewing what I'm doing. And do the most important thing first. What is a priority? If you're unsure of the priority, ask. What are your priorities? So when my manager assigns me work and says, can you get me these documents? And they'd give me two or three different things. Um, I always ask, what would you like first? When would you like that by? So that I know what I need to prioritize if I'm unsure. Use the urgent or important matrix as well and use your diary. So I do planning in my diary as well when I have projects and I block time out specifically coming up to the deadline of any projects that I'm running so that I can make sure that everything is complete on, on time, especially if I have to write a report, I give myself the time to do that. And get feedback as well. You know, don't be afraid to ask for feedback. And I always approach feedback in a way that I'm open to being schooled any day because I don't take it personally. If somebody says you could have done X, Y, and Z better, this is how I would like you to do it in the future. That is a learning experience for me. It's a learning opportunity. So always take any kind, as long as it's constructive feedback, in a, you know, a learning opportunity way, then you will be fine accepting feedback. It's not an attack on you or your personality as long as it's constructive. And you can use that feedback then going forward to improve your performance. And again, approach your manager if you need to get clarification on what needs to be prioritized. This is what I mentioned at the start around recording your experiences. So this is specifically for those of you who are doing a placement um, or an internship or an insight week or a summer school. Record your experiences, note the situation and date, and you can use the CAR approach, context, action, result. What context? two lines. Um, I was given a project to update uh, the email signature list for the company. That's your context. What actions did you take? You uh, spoke to the receptionist desk. They gave you a list of all the new employees. You gathered the data. You searched the data uh, on the company uh, database. You created a, a group whatever it may be. Um, and then the result was that you were able to create an effective and eye-catching um, contact list for the for the company. So again, just looking at how how can you record that situation and the date? When did it happen so that you know for your records? What happened? What did you learn from this and what might you do differently in the future? And that 
last question there is really important because if an employer asks you give an example of when a time didn't go well in an interview you can potentially look back on your experiences or your work experience journal and say well this is a time when something didn't go well and the reason they ask that question is they want to know how self-aware are you and how can you identify when things uh, didn't go well and do you accept that they didn't go well and what did you learn from that experience so that you don't do it again so that's what they're looking for from you that you're developing you're self-aware and you you understand what you need to do to develop further so this again can help to inform your decision making going forward and give you future interview examples by the end of your first year in the workplace whether it's placement or graduate opportunity or you've done a couple of different internships you will hopefully feel more comfortable in the organization and the company culture. You'll be confident in knowing what your strengths and what your contributions to the company are, and that you can put that information on your CV, on your LinkedIn, and discuss it very confidently at interview. You have a clear idea of the next steps. What did you like from that experience? What did you like from that career? And what do you want to do going forward? Um, and it informs that career development and progression. Helping mentor new members of the team. It's a great opportunity when you've been there for a period of time, offering to mentor any new incoming um, members of the team looks great on your CV, looks great on LinkedIn and helps in your uh, professional development of managing, leading and supervising others. And hopefully you will be better connected. You will have great LinkedIn uh, connections, but also endorsements. If you have connections on LinkedIn and you've worked really well with a member of the team, get them to write you a LinkedIn endorsement, two, three lines. What did they, you know, what was most memorable about working with you? Or if there was a particular project you worked with together, what went well? And connecting with alumni and careers as well can really help. So to gain a better understanding of your skills and employability, it really helps for you to look at Career Edge Plus. So if you haven't engaged in Career Edge Plus already, this is something that I would really advise you to do. So Career Edge Plus is a platform that we supply you that gives you access to um, a software. And it's a short exercise that you take, you answer a number of questions and it helps to identify your skills and your knowledge and your strengths and also helps to identify areas where you can improve. So this is the QR code. You can engage with the platform and I really would encourage you to engage with the platform, but also with our YouTube channel. So our YouTube channel has some great information on there around LinkedIn the, um, and some panel events as well. The Inspire Global Networks events, with, which we work with alumni and employers and experts globally to deliver really important topics such as the power of neurodiversity. We also had one on careers in, with sustainability as well, the careers with purpose. So do check out our YouTube channel for some great resources. And then if you want to connect with us at the Career Service, you can make an appointment to see a careers coach on Careers Connect. You'll see the QR code there for Careers Connect. You can register for workshops, employer presentations, apply for jobs, internships and placements. But also you, we have a number of different drop-ins as well that you can join. And if you've got any questions and we've not answered them here today, you can email lumscareers at lancaster.ac.uk and myself or a colleague will respond to you.